Summit Stock Taking Moment, and we will be discussing catalytic donor funding and blended finance. I'm Oshani Pereira, co-founder of the Shamba Center. I'll be your moderator this evening. And our objective today is twofold. Firstly, we want to establish the importance of catalytic funding by donors. And secondly, we want to discuss the feasibility and the practicality of blended finance in food and agriculture. We are inviting our audience to keep asking our speakers questions, place, place them in the chat. Our speakers will be responding to them throughout the event. So will the sustainable finance team at the Shamba Center. The webinar will be recorded. It will be on the websites of both the Shamba Center and the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. And the biographies of the speakers will also be appearing in the chat. So the chat is the place to keep your eye on. And let us begin. I turn to Tristan Armstrong, co-chair of the Global Donor Platform, to start this webinar and tell us the importance of catalytic donor financing. Tristan, over Thanks. to you. Thanks very much, Ashani, and it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, excellencies, distinguished representatives, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everyone here. My name is Tristan. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the GDPRD, the Global Donor Platform. Um, and also during the day here in Australia, um, I'm the senior advisor for international agricultural development at Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. My sincere thanks to all of you for participating in today's UN Food System Summit Plus Two side event which we are calling Innovative Donor Approaches to Sustainable Finance for Food Systems Transformation. The event's being co-hosted, as you know, by the Global Donor Platform and also the Shamba Center for Food and Climate. We're absolutely, absolutely des delighted to see so many of you joining right now. So welcome. This week, amazingly, marks two full years since the UN Food System Summit, where the global donor community was called upon to increase our investments in food systems transformation by an ambitious, 300 to 350 billion per year. While there are numerous methodologies for estimating the actual ODA funding directed towards food systems, the general consensus is that current amounts, the current, that currently this amount amounts to only around 20 US, 20 billion US per year. And uh, we have a slide indicating that that's coming up. As outlined very clearly in this series 2030 report published now in 2020, in order to achieve this huge funding gap and to have any chance of ending hunger and doubling the incomes of small producers, global donors need to contribute an additional US dollar 14 billion per year um, until 2030. Put simply, what we are doing today is nowhere near enough. And it is clear that donors cannot bridge this funding gap by themselves. At the same time as this conversation has been happening, um, and many of us have been part of that conversation over the last few years, global hunger has been rising sharply. The latest FAO figures indicate that at least 735 million are currently facing hunger compared to 613 million in 2019, an increase of 122 million. As you know, a number of factors have clearly been responsible for this sharp increase, including the disruptions caused by COVID, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and perhaps most concerningly, the ever increasing impacts of climate change that many of you around the table here tonight will be only too aware of. So it is very clear that um, our community, our global donor community needs to cast our net further and make our funding much more catalytic in order to make genuine progress in this sector. Collaboration between donors and the private sector has never been more critical and I don't believe that we've done anywhere near enough to, to further that aim. Business as usual isn't working and simply won't work. We need to, to change our business model. We have to be bolder. We have to ask the difficult questions and take some risks. We must create new partnerships and also support the re research and evaluation that's needed to critically interrogate our assumptions 
we must learn from the body of evidence that's already out there um, and that many of us don't have the time to really dig into on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's what conversations like this and partnerships like this are so important uh, in doing. In light of this, today's event is all about energizing this discussion and refocusing us here. Um, we need to come together to begin asking some of those key questions, to share our experiences and to really support each other's collective efforts to, to, to do this. Um, you know, how can we as donors make our funding more catalytic? How can ODA for food systems increase synergies with other sources of development finance that exist, including climate finance, gender finance, and the ever increasing amount of emergency assistance that we see coming out of our budgets? To what extent should donors be looking to use our ODA funding to mobilize philanthropic uh, and private, section, private sector providers? And how can our, our funding be used most effectively for, for de-risking other forms of investment? One of the key mechanisms for engaging with the private sector is of course through blended finance. And we hear that a lot, um, which today we'll be exploring in more detail and hopefully um, creating greater clarity around um, the, the models that, that can be used in that area. There are also other promising avenues that have yet to be fully explored, including price challenges, advanced mar market commitments, just to name a couple. The Global Donor Platform and the Shamba Center for Food and Climate have been undertaking research over the last few months on how we can make public funding streams more catalytic. We encourage all of you to participate enthusiastically with us through, through this short event. Today's dialogue will be an opportunity to raise questions and share experiences and perspectives. We also encourage you to reach out to us if you have experience in the application of innovative financing approaches and would like to contribute with us to this ongoing work stream. With over a quarter of a billion people acutely insecure, food insecure around the world, today it is vital to accelerate innovative financing mechanisms to achieve zero hunger. With this, I am delighted to pass the floor over to Talin Alkavash, Senior Partnership Officer at the International Fund for Rural Develop for Agricultural Development. Thank you again for, for your attendance to everyone and over to you, Talin. Thank you, Tristan, for this uh, good introduction. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar, whatever you're linking uh, from. My name is Tulin, and I recently joined IFAD, coming from EBRD, uh, where I covered a couple of blended finance tools in EBRD, uh, focusing on high-risk uh, uh, countries such as Ukraine and West Bank and Gaza. Um, in this presentation, I will present a couple of tools that we usually uh, use in blended finance. Um, I, I didn't want to go into uh, the OECD definition and what, what uh, IMF or the World Bank or IFAD. So I thought just telling you a story about blended finance and how it works mechanically between donors and private sectors. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Okay, so can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, Tulin, we can see your screen, but we see the the PowerPoint marine presentation. Yeah, yeah, it it just keeps uh, it it keeps shifting um, each time I uh, I change it. Uh, so let me just try to do this. Oops. Okay, I'm gonna have to. Um... Okay, Michelle, can you share my my presentation? Sorry. Julian, you have you do you have, you have to unshare your screen? I know, I know. It just keeps. Uh, it just keeps. It it just keeps. Um taking me back to the uh, to the the slideshow and and it keeps jumping between two slides maybe i'll just try again oh michelle would you like to do it ah thanks michelle okay um so if if you are to uh look into blended finance if you just go to google and uh write down blended finance um you'll find different terminology so if we can go to the first slide so you see all those kind of terminologies, um, and they're quite, um, you know, um, 
complicated. And if you don't come from a finance background or you've never worked in blended finance, you'll find them challenging to understand. It's another language. In this presentation, we will be covering mainly two types of um, mechanism. We're going to talk about guarantees and we will be talking about incentive grants. Um, next. Okay, so um, let's imagine you have a bakery shop and uh, this bakery shop uh, requires a new oven uh, and uh, you need some financing for your new oven. Uh, and you go to the bank and you ask for this financing. Next. Or you are a truck driver and you would like uh, to buy a new truck because you can't afford the cost of your uh, transport, uh, given the new, um, you know, the, the fuel prices. So you go to the bank and you ask for financing for the new truck. What happens at the bank? The bank will, in many cases, they will say no. And um, in what happens with banks and small business holders is that certain segments are considered high risk. For example, women owned businesses are considered high risk because the bank look at the woman as like, oh, she has to take care of the family. Maybe she will go for um, for some time off. Um, she she's she's going to be very busy taking care of her children. So some of the cultural norms actually are challenging when it comes to banks approving financing uh, in certain areas. Also for the farmers and for, for the people who work in the, in the value chain of, of agribusiness, it is also a risky segment. So what happens when you have a, a sudden drought or a sudden flood and you don't have any food to transport? So that truck driver actually will be out of, of job because there's not much to transport when it comes to the food system. Um, so you go to the bank um, and this, they say no. So this is how blended finance works. So if you can go next. Okay, um, basically, as you know, commercial banks, they borrow from central banks and they also borrow from other commercial banks, but they also borrow from MDBs. And what happens in, in the case of guarantees is the MD, MDB like EBRD, FAD, IFC, they provide loan to the commercial bank and that loan goes on lent to other SMEs and therefore could reach out to our uh, bakery. Now, if, if the bakery could, could default on certain payments that she, she would have afforded if she was, she was in a better place, um, then there's a guarantee deployed by the donor money to pay for those defaults. The guarantees comes from the donor as grants. And, and it's important to realize that there is a lot of, this is just a fraction of one scenario. This is that, that could go into a different scenarios. Uh, sometimes, um, the bank puts its own money. Sometimes they don't need liquidity. They only need the guarantees. Um, so it, it really depends on the economics. Sometimes concessionality um, uh, plays an important role here. Sometimes the, um, the, the, the lending is on commercial basis. Sometimes uh, it is, um, the tenor is longer. So basically what is important here to realize that guarantees are, they play a very important role in uh, backing up uh, those loans from the MB MDBs to the commercial banks. Last slide. On the truck driver, where he goes to the bank and he's rejected, this is where incentive payments come. He's converting a truck into a hybrid truck. So basically, he would still take a commercial loan um, with commercial interest rate. However, at a certain point, he will get a cash back incentives, let's say up to 5% or 10%. Really depends on, on, again, how this is structured and how the economy um, is designed um, uh, to, to accept such tools, because incentive payments usually are, uh, you know, critical when it comes to disturbing the market, but they're quite critical when it comes to climate. Um, and again, he goes, he pays back his loans, and then he gets a 5 or 10% uh, back because he's buying a hybrid truck. So this is just two examples of, uh, of how blended finance works uh, in a very, very basic term. Thank you. Thank you, Talene. Uh, marvelous stories and examples.
uh, guarantees, incentive payments, very important mechanisms to enable blended finance to flow. And I turn to Ambassador Hans Hohevein. Ambassador, you have been working on trying to facilitate blended finance for a very long time. You have spoke to me, spoken to me at length about some of the problems you face. Could you tell us about the uncomfortable truth about the difficulties in promoting blended finance in food and agriculture? Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Oshani, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen or good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, because uh, when we are virtually, everybody can follow us. And I've discussed it with Oshani in preparations. And I think if we really want to have a fundamental change in transforming our food systems, we need also a transformative change in our financing system. Uh, and we have to face the uncomfortable truth. Let me start briefly by the opening statement this afternoon by the Secretary General, it hear us on the uh, World Food System Summit Plus Two. He said, there's an urgent need for bold action. To feed our planet, we have to feed our people. Developing countries are struggling in financing that transformation of their food systems. At the same time, he said, there's more than enough money available worldwide to do this. But he said, we need to move to massive investments in food systems. Also in a statement said, it will not come from the donor community, at least the traditional donors. Because when you look to the traditional donors, it will be of course, mostly or mainly the governments. The total pie, and that's the ODA, is not increasing, but is decreasing. And what you see is now not only we ask money for food systems, we ask money for a new biodiversity fund, another fund, and it creates again competition for the lack of availability of public resources. At the same time, there is enormous possibility for private sector investments. But we have to face the uncomfortable truth also where we are standing, because we are seven years, less than, less than seven years before 2030. And there we have said we will have world without hunger. In 1996, we had the first food system summit with 800 million people in hunger. Now 2023, we saw the SOFI report, the state of food and, food and agriculture uh, and food security. We still have 800 million people in hunger. So I'll leave up to you the question, did we do enough? Did we fail? But one thing is clear, we have to change our system because we are not tackling the problems. Also, when we look to the Food System Summit, and there is a lot of energy in the room, but it's two years later, and it's called the stock taking. This morning and this afternoon, I heard again the challenges. I heard the commitments, but there were no new commitments. There were no new financial uh, commitments. There were no new actions taken. And when you look to the actions taken at the Food System Summit two years ago, there were 131 coalitions. More than 100 and perhaps even 120 coalitions imploded. So that's where we are. Still, I think the glass is more than half full because I know, and that's what's the call also from the Secretary General and many uh, uh, financial specialists today, we have to work with the private sector, their investments. And there I was hoping for a strong statement this afternoon or this morning by the World Bank and IFAD and I was really disappointed. I say it honestly, uh, it was also the uncomfortable truth because I said, yeah, we are creating a new financial architecture for financing food system transformation. And they came forward that we are setting up a new data system. Of course, we need the data, but don't forget that the countries know what they are investing in their food systems. What we need, of course, is support to the, get those private sector investments done. For that, we need, and we, the private sector companies and companies are not asking funding from the UN. What they ask is helping them with the first risk financing. And we'll show a slide now, hopefully, with the first, what is first risk financing. 
is that I have an example for a company, a, a dairy company, Fison Campino, is willing to invest 75 million US dollars in Nigeria for transforming the system, the dairy system, reducing food losses, reducing methane uh, emissions, reducing CO2 emissions. What they need in those five year programs, 75 million US dollars, is some first risk financing. And it can be done via guarantees, by uh, insurance, but it can also be done by technical assistance support. What they're asking now, and the proposal has made to EFAT, they asked for 5 million technical support for the farmers. We have been working now for two and two and a half years. Vice President of Nigeria is at this moment speaking with the president of EFAT. I do hope that there is a breakthrough. Otherwise, we are going to lose this private sector investment. And that's what is at stake at this moment. If we can find that mechanism, and there we have financial institutions like EFAT and the World Bank, and they have more than enough money. And sometimes I think they are more occupied with their, I would say, uh, AAA rating. Yes, I know I have to stop. I quit AAA rating or getting uh, more funding from donors. But let's focus. They have the key to unlock, unlock the investment at a massive scale, as the Secretary General is asking, in the developing countries. And I know at least 40 companies we, which are willing to invest more than $200 million. But that first risk financing has to come, has to be unlocked via World Bank, IFAD, and also the uh, MDBs. My question is, let's do it. What's holding us back? Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Very compelling. Thank you. Christopher Wayne. Uh, Chris, the investment philosophy of the Acumen Fund speaks to and takes slightly a different tack to what Talim and the ambassador have been telling us about. So you provide debt and equity in investments to small holder agribusinesses who are working with small, small farmers, and you take a return of 0 0.89 cents on the dollar. And I repeat, eight, 0 0.89 cents on the dollar. Now, this is very long, very patient capital. Chris, please tell us more. Thanks, Oshani, and uh, appreciate the, the comments leading into my piece. I think it sets, sets the stage very well, both Tulane and the ambassador. Um, and if the slide can be shown, um, I can introduce you to our model at Acumen, which is um, is now quite old. Uh, we're hitting our 20th year anniversary. Um, and way back in 2001, our founder, Jacqueline Novogratz, decided that she wanted to join the rigor of private markets with the flexibility and social ambition of philanthropy. Um, and to do so, she created the really simple model that you're seeing here today. Um, and it exists today at, at our pioneer level of investing. We take in philanthropy grant dollars. Um, we make investments into early stage entrepreneurs solving problems of poverty. And then we support the company growth through a whole range of post-investment support, including one-on-one -on -one sort of business development and strategic finance, governance, impact, um, access to technical assistance grants for additional business development, and regularly strategic leverage of our, our whole C-suite um, down to our, our president and CEO. Um, and as the graphic shows, um, those relationships with our companies are lasting often more than a decade. Um, this is a, a long-term relationship. Um, and it really is, in, in our eyes, the essence of, of patient capital um, is that support. Any exits um, from our investments are recycled um, back into our system and into new investments um, and, and associated costs. Um, We've been doing this since 2001, if we, if we move over to the next slide, um, and, and since 2004, uh, specifically in agriculture, um, and have learned a huge amount um, over that time about the challenges of investing um, in agriculture and emerging markets, um, and really the, the need to understand the in, sort of interdependence, if you will, of agricultural systems that you're investing in, which I think is, is key. 
Um, and our new initiative, Trellis, uh, puts sort of the learning from, from those what's now 18 years of investing at the foundation of a, of a new investment strategy. And we're really pleased to have um, actually fellow panelists here today, FCDO, on board as a, an early supporter of this initiative. Um, and, and even more happy to announce that we've made our first two investments uh, with a third uh, following this week, uh, we're hopeful, uh, in some of these early stage companies. And um, to put some faces over the stories and, and just those sort of words um, in many ways, if we can jump to the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a Sierra Leonean company um, called Lizard Earth. Um, over the course of a, a given year, a, a small cow farmer uh, in Sierra Leone will cultivate, plan, prune, you know, water, fertilize, harvest um, their cocoa trees and expect to earn no more than $200 over the course of that entire year. Um, and that's the harsh reality that the founders of Lizard Earth sort of faced as they conceived of this aggregation and processing business in Cal Calahoun, which is one of Sierra Leone's lowest income districts. Um, so great growing conditions for cocoa, um, but the sector was super underdeveloped um, since the end of the Civil War. Aging trees, inefficient agroforestry practices, and sort of inefficient supply chains broadly. Um, a lot of invest, a lot of companies would see that and run away. But Lizard Earth saw a possibility here. They structured a business model around a 365-day climate resilient agricultural training program for these farmers, a community-level fermentation and drying center, bean processing centralized, um, and a plantation management model that sort of fostered entrepreneurship for many of these farmers going through their program. Um, in essence, they help farmers grow better cocoa then they buy it from them at a premium price um, and drive that value back into the farmer businesses that they're working with. And the, the impacts have been extraordinary. Uh, we survey all of our, uh, all of our farmer participants um, that are being served by these companies and 98% in this case, 84% um, of whom live below the poverty line in Sierra Leone reported a minimum increase, um, uh, income increase of 30%. Um, and 99% reported that their quality of life had improved. Um, and we're looking at uh, some of the first time access to this level of markets in the history question. Um, so that impact is, is both transformational and relatively cheap. This was a $500,000 convertible investment from Acumen. Um, and Lizard Earth has developed additional land with that, built infrastructure, addressed working capital concerns. Um, the takeaway is this. We need entrepreneurs with big ideas to take big swings. And they need patient capital that's willing to take risks and share risk with, with them. So those risks are real. The markets are hard. We know that. On aggregate, our investments uh, don't pay for themselves. It needs philanthropy and incredibly patient philanthropy. And, and Chris, now you're moving these SMEs onto the next stage of risk financing through the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Fund. And what's amazing here is you yourself have taken the first loss along with the Green Climate Fund. And that tells us something very important, that you have deep deep confidence and deep comfort in the business models and the revenue models of these SMEs. Could you please take us through this, Chris? Sure. Thanks, Roshani. Great prompt. And, uh, you know, there's always more work to be done to, to validate these business models because um, that's what's really going to drive catalytic capital to ensure that there's the risk appetite for more commercial stage capital. But uh, back in 2016, as early as that, we started to conceive of a later stage growth fund for agricultural development, a pure sort of blended finance facility, uh, as Tulin would describe it, that, that, that promised returns, but also could supercharge some of our earliest stage uh, investments and most scalable investments. Our goal here at Acumen is to hit multiple points of this Philanthropic, excuse me, of this sort of pipeline of social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship SMEs in emerging markets. So we conceived of and then and then uh, you know raised our Acumen Resilient Agriculture Fund. It's a fifty-eight million dollar impact agri VC fund designed to enhance the livelihoods and climate resilience of ten million people uh, in Africa. It invests you know relatively small tickets, three hundred k up to four million in in early and early growth stage agribusinesses with business models that help you know smallholder farmers in east and west africa adapt to climate change 
we invest primarily equity and quasi equity in, in those businesses, um, often with world class founders committed to building profitability. The fund, as it states here, is backed by a six million dollar technical assistance facility that allows the fund to support portfolio companies with grants, um, business development activities, ESG capabilities, and in many cases to train farmers on climate smart practices themselves. It really was the first of its kind equity fund um, providing that critical capital to support African agribusinesses that help smallholder farmers adapt to climate change. Um, again, key anchoring point by the Green Climate Fund. Um, it's also supported by the Dutch Entrepreneurial Development Bank, FMO, the Soros Economic Development Fund, Paparco, a whole range of other uh, of sort of large scale institutional investors. And then critically, IKEA Foundation and other folks came in to support some of the, the, the really uh, critical first loss piece here. It's, ac it's actually managed by Acumen Capital Partners, which is a wholly owned subsidi subsidiary of Acumen. Um, and it was really GCF, IKEA, and FCDO that supported um, the technical assistance facility. And just to give you an example of, of, of how this could work um, put in practice, and this, this is uh, harder than, than it sounds uh, through this example, and I'll fully acknowledge that. But um, the company Ethio Chicken is a, a great example of one that's moved from our patient capital investing to growth stage investing. They provide smallholder farmers with a, a really robust disease resistant chicken that can thrive in local rural conditions and is significantly more pr productive in terms of eggs eggs, eggs made um, than local burns, birds. Um, and believe that those dual purpose birds can eliminate poverty and malnutrition uh, across East Africa. Um, and way back in 2014, Acumen invested $500,000 into the company. They were at that point only selling um, 600,000 chickens per week, per, per, per year, uh, to families in Ethiopia. Today, we're happy to announce that they sell 600,000 chickens per week, um, and have adapted sort of their operations dramatically through an ARAF innovation, uh, iteration of this called Uzima chicken. They've now expanded to Burundi, to Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. Uh, a third iteration of this, Flow Equity, um, is supported by ARF, expanding them to Kenya, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, and Malawi. Amazing, uh, Chris. Uh, your work is amazing. And it speaks to what Kristen, Kristen said earlier when he opened this event, that there has to be this tight trust collaboration and systemic link between the different providers of philanthropy, capital, and risk money. Oh, fantastic work, thank you. And if I may turn back again to Ambassador Hohavain, Ambassador listening to Chris, what are your thoughts across the many years you've been pushing blended finance? What are your thoughts on the transaction costs and the bottlenecks to do what Chris has done? You know, I very much support and believe what was said by Chris. And I think what we have to avoid is what we often do, certainly within the UN system and data work I'm doing, is we think only globally and we would try to, I would say, develop the whole system for all countries, etc. What we have to do is what we are, for example, now doing uh, with food losses is we make a country profile. We have done it for uh, Nigeria. We have done it for Rwanda. We make a country profile where the hotspots are, in which commodities the, the biggest losses are, and where in the value chain the losses are. Is it the harvesting? Is it the processing? Is it uh, uh, storage, etc.? Based on that, and that has been done by the World Bank and FEO, based on that model, we organize, and that's what, how it can work, we organize small round tables, not round tables with everybody, but with, with targeted uh, people from the government, especially Minister of Finance, Agriculture, and the Prime Minister's Office, from, uh, of course, World, World Bank and uh, IFAD, FEO, but also companies who have an interest in building a business case in those losses. We have done it with ODAM, we have done it with DSM, we have done doing it now with Fries Campina. They make the business case, and we ask them the question, what do you need to get your investment done? What do you need from, uh, for example, from the government? Is it uh, infrastructure? Is it uh, permits, etc.? But what do you also need for the financing? And every time it comes back to the first risk financing. 
But then I think it's important to show that although we say first risk financing, the question is whether it will be called in. We have the example for DSM, who built a factory uh, in uh, Rwanda in the province. Started with five thousand farmers. They are working now with thirty thousand farmers. They buy the harvest on a five-year uh, term. The price has been set by the Minister of Agriculture of Rwanda, and you see a flourishing agriculture sector, economic sector, but also health sector. There was a first risk financing which was not called in. And let's not forget, everybody's seeing, of course, and it is true that the value chains and the food systems are a risk, could be a risky sector. But the World Bank has also shown that investing one dollar in a, in a food, uh, at least in the value chain or agriculture, has a return of three US dollars. And making the mechanism where you try also to minimize the risk for the investors whether it would be equity, whether it would be pension funds, whether it would be, uh, I would say, even IFAD and World Bank, that model is working. The question is now how to scale it up. And that is not a question anymore about tech, tech about the technical part. It's a bureaucracy we have to fight. And it comes down to, I would say, those who dare to take the next step. And for that, we have appointed presidents, we have elected people, but we have to push them. And I know for sure that what I've seen from uh, private investors, also equity and pension investors, they are willing to step in. But they need to have a trustworthy partner on the other side as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Do they dare to step in is what we will remember from your intervention. Thank you. Shawang Doji. Shawang, listening to the speakers before you, you are providing ever more patient, ever more market making money. And the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, is moving more climate money into the agri food space. Uh, this is very good news. The least developed country fund of the GEF. Four to six countries on the fund, you're providing them 20 million US dollars each for four thematic areas. Take us through these developments, please. Shawang, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Shani. And listening very closely to what ambassadors and rest of the panelists has to say, it's very uh, inspiring on the opportunities that we have to work together in trying to pull. Uh, especially the, you know, not so much money available uh, in internationally for us to make a, a visible impact uh, on the ground. Um, so as, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Tong Doji. I'm a climate change specialist at the Global Environment Facilities. Um, just as a way of introduction, if you can move to the next slide, please. I wanted to just show you where we are coming from as Jeff. Um, we serve a number of international financial mechanisms and we manage uh, family of funds, to be honest, uh, to, you know, and on, on our latest uh, editions of the fund is the Global Biodiversity Fund, which is now entrusted uh, to Jeff as well as to manage. Um, the the reason um, I'm mentioning this is because um, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, like Jeff, there are other funding mechanisms internationally as well, serving various international conventions that we probably might have to pull it together uh, to have a larger, larger impact. Um, for myself, I work with the climate change adaptations of the least developed countries and the special climate change fund. Uh, what it looks like in terms of my work is that um, that we administer grant. Uh, you know, we don't do loan. We only provide. Uh, you know, we administer the grant uh, funding support for climate change adaptation action. And our particular focus for the LDCF is we work with the uh, forty-six uh, least developed countries, as Oshani you mentioned. And, uh, you know, listening to Chris as well, that, you know, there's a number of investment going into uh, Africa, you know, for us, uh, for, from LDCF uh, and uh, from LDCF perspectives, we have a huge chunk of portfolio in, in Africa, to be honest, about 67% because that reflecting that, you know, there out of uh, 46, we have 33 LDCs in, in Africa and keeping that in mind, we have a large chunk of investments going there. 
Um, you know, but the reason I wanted to speak to you uh, today is actually on on how the climate finance, because the climate change, uh, as as mentioned by Ambassador and various speakers ahead of me, uh, it's I think it's on top of our everyone's mind at this point of time because of various impacts that we have. Can you please go to the next slide, please? And um, uh, based on various signs and guidance from the conference of parties as well as priorities of the countries, we have put out a new strategy that's spanning for four years, and there are four thematic focus areas that we'll be putting, as, as you have mentioned, Oshani, the $20 million for each LDCs. And I, we believe that each of these thematic areas are closely interrelated in what happens at the, at the, at the food system sector. Um, if you go to the next slide, and, and, and that's true as well, because uh, we have invested, honestly, more than a billion dollars in terms of food-related uh, food related sectors uh, with, between uh, uh, Special Climate Change Fund and, and LDCA funds, as you can see here. And, and reflecting again, it, it goes into largely into uh, least developed uh, countries. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And... And Shawan, could you also tell us about the JEF Integrated Program on Food Systems? This is very exciting. Yes, so this is, uh, you know, I've been talking so far about what LDCF and SCCF does. And as I've mentioned on my, uh, you know, on the first slides of JEF, number of different funds that we managed. And one of them fund that in, in 30 years that was given birth to us, JEF Trust Fund. And JEF Trust Fund has also made a strong evolution in our sense in trying to address um, uh, you know, all the required elements in terms of the food system transformations. It goes back to 2014 when a pilot program was started. And that pilot program looks at um, how do we build the resilience uh, food systems. And that pilot program actually gave lots of important lessons. And when Jeff 70 started in 2018, uh, that program actually became uh, one of the uh, integrated impacts program for food system transformations. We learned a lot of lessons from that as well. And we are actually in the first year of implementations of JEF 8 programming. What that means in terms of food systems is that now we have a, a full-fledged um, uh, impacts program uh, under the food systems. What it tries to do is that it, you know, we intend to scale up all those investment and lessons that we have learned uh, since 2014. And, and we did, uh, you know, Hopefully that will actually, you know, the word that I've got here is catalyzing, uh, catalyze the transformations to sustainable food systems that are nature positive, resilient and, and pollution resistant. And I must just quickly mention that my colleague, Peter, who actually manages the program, he's, he's attending the conference in person in Rome. So if you happen to be in Rome and if you wanted to get more information, just, you know, just shout it to him and he's, he's there uh, on the ground. Um, thank you very much. Back to your channel. Thank you, Shawan. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure many of us will be reaching out to Peter. And it's fantastic to see the Jeff moving into food systems. Absolutely brilliant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a poll. And I shall pass the microphone on to Sierra Berardelli from the Global Donor Platform to walk us through the poll. Sierra, over to you. Thank you, Oshani. So we have now launched our poll. If everybody could please cast a single vote responding to the following question and then hit submit. Blended finance works best when it addresses market failures, the interests of all parties involved are aligned, it complements rather than crowds out other funding sources, it enables impact that would not have been possible otherwise, it comes with capacity building for long-term impact, it empowers small-scale farmers and producers, and all of the above. So we currently have 16 responses. We'll give another 30 seconds or so for everybody to hit submit. Okay, we're at about 78% respondents.
Okay, so for our responses, we see blended finance works best when and all of the above at 52%. This is then followed by it enables impact that would not have been possible otherwise, followed by it empowers small scale farmers slash producers, and it complements rather than crowds out other funding sources. And the least response, it addresses market failures and it comes with capacity building for long-term impact. So thank you very much everybody for responding. And with that, I pass the floor back to you, Oshani. Thank you so much, Sierra. Thank you. And now we will hear from Iris Kraber. Iris. When we look at the FCDO commercial agriculture portfolio review dated June 2023, we note the success of ODA for agriculture is one of the key ways and the most effective ways to reduce poverty. And this tells us something very important that if we want to increase blended financing in agriculture, we cannot start with the small scale producer or the small scale aggregator or the small scale farmer, because there is not enough comparability, not enough maturity, not enough stability, and not enough financial feasibility in these entities. We need to start much higher. And since we are still in the business of addressing poverty and ending hunger, Iris, could you take us all on and tell us, is blended finance a distraction? Over to thanks, you. Thanks very much, Oshani, and thanks for your kind words. Maybe for the other participants, um, um, as background, we had a 15-month review by an independent committee of the UK Parliament of everything we do in agriculture in an era of climate change from 2016 to today. At the same time, we um, commission a biannual commercial agriculture portfolio review and, and messages were broadly the same. They were not quiet, as you said, Oshani, so I, I take your challenge on that one. They saw a lot that was good, but there was also a lot that they said either we can't say anything about or that needs to do a lot better if UK order is involved. And that was mostly around blended finance. So what does that tell us? It doesn't say you can't work with smallholders or you have to go higher up. It says specific things. And um, your list was a little bit unfair, Sierra, earlier. Um, it wasn't all of the above. It was certain things in certain contexts. And I think one of the ones I ticked was um, the interests of, um, the various parties involved need to be aligned. If you don't have that, forget about blended finance. I think Chris Wayne in Acumen Fund put it very clearly. Um, your starting point was to match the rigor of private sector markets with the ambition of social, human and broader economic development. So what does that mean? When, when I see how we talk about blended finance, very often we fail to have this conversation among all involved, what are the objectives? Yeah, and what do we really want and be honest with each other? What are we talking about? Um, so what, what does a private sector investor mean when they talk about food security? Who's, where, at what level? What do we all mean when we talk about sustainability? Most private sector investment investors we speak to for initially think, of course, financial sustainability because without it, you don't even start. But we also think about climate sustainability. Now then you have um, climate, what was it? Climate beneficial and nature positive. I've worked in this business for decades. I still have no clue what the difference is. And I saw earlier pollution reduce. Is that something else altogether? So just to give you these examples to, to, to appeal for us to be clear about what are we talking about? What are the objectives? Are we agree that these are the objectives? So if Acumen Fund says we're willing to take a loss, fantastic. 
then um, other we've talked to other partners who are not willing to take a loss, who have to have a return on investment, let's say 3%, then they might not be our partners in agriculture that delivers maximum development impact. That may not be possible, but let's have this conversation. So we can be aligned around our various interests and objectives. And then let's agree on what we measure. To give you another example that came out in this parliamentary review, we were all very happy to invest in, what was it? Um, a su super duper smallholder beneficial macadamia supply chain in Malawi. Great, financial return guaranteed, fantastic, superb. 10 years time, but those macadamias won't grow with climate change. The response will be, yeah, but we can't really know that. Yes, we can. Any, any investor who these days says, we can't know that, hasn't done their homework on risk assessment, physical climate risk assessment. That speaks to greenwashing. If we want to help smallholders invest in their future beyond the next five years, can we please be clear about what really benefits them and what prevents maladaptation? All of these things need to be on the table, need to be looked at, need to be agreed before investment choices are made and agreed, and they need to be accompanied with... Um, with robust monitoring. Somebody also said earlier, there is a lot of TA that's needed. We found that in our, in our investments. For example, we've, we've, we've um, spent tens of millions of UK orders subsidizing GAFSP, private sector window, to just provide TA, going into the poorest countries to seek out opportunities where others might do um, seed investing. That's not for IFC, but to seek out opportunities, to generate those opportunities, to support um, new investments, to de-risk, to maximize the development impact, and to work with these with countries and investments afterwards. So that, that costs a lot of money and that needs to be grant. That must be grant money. We've also put investment money in to pull out, to leverage other funding in, in, in that they, many of you have spoken about de-risking. That is the greatest challenge. You need advanced grant. At some point, you need maybe a returnable grant as donors. I think we should give a lot more money as grant. As Hans has said before, the pie needs to grow. We cannot just steal from Peter to give to Paul to say, oh, we'll have more climate money and humanitarian or biodiversity or whatnot, and assume the, po the pot cannot grow, but we'll take all those boxes. And it can't just be loan where grant is needed to originate deals, to nurture them to a, to a stage where a loan can be beneficial. And at the moment, we've, committed, we've commissioned a quick policy brief earlier in the year about what we can expect from the private sector if the objective is food security. Well, the response was a bit sobering. There's a lot of great stuff that's happening, but let's be fair, private sector is in there to make money if you have an area like Somalia, Yemen, high acute food insecurity. They are very, very limited things other than CSR that can really be done. Also because it's super high risk, then you need grant again to buy down the risk, to generate opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. Another lesson was we all tend to, well, we all love working with the IFC because our donor money is safe with them, but then they say themselves they are not in the space of small scale, they're not in the space of origination. And they also mostly um, work higher up. So where the need is to work with local SMEs, then we need others. And that needs to be probably that deal pipeline needs to be improved a lot. Um, so when you ask me, is um, blended finance a distraction? Only if we talk without clarifying what we actually talk about what we want and where it's needed. Um, so it's not a panacea. I would wholeheartedly agree with Hans saying we need to grow the pie, whatever money comes in, but that needs to be based on agreed objectives and a results framework that's robustly monitored to enable us to demonstrate results, but also to learn and to fail. And when we fail, we fail fast. Um, I'll leave it at that, Oshani. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Iris. Very important to take away what you said at the very end. It's very important that we are allowed to fail. And if you're allowed to fail, it could be a fast failure. Um, we do have a few minutes 
for one question that the audience is posing. And that is the last question that came up from Arun Raditya that says, for small producers that are working in a given landscape and don't have the technical expertise to understand a phenomena like you were describing, Iris, shall we plant macadamia or shall we plant a much more climate resistant and water resistant crop? Where would be the first point of entry for business acumen? Would you like to answer it, please, Iris? That is a good question. I would suggest um, acumen probably, um, that's probably for acumen to answer. You probably take your priority countries and then you go in. And what we've done with our DFI, BII and others is to um, make them understand that their physical climate risk assessment shouldn't come after the investment choices has, have been made, but before. And these days, um, there is enough agreement among the experts to to agree on what can be done, how and when, and what's beneficial. You write an algorithm, you run it, and then you get stuck into the options. I think Acumen probably does the same, but this needs to be before investment choices. It also needs to involve those whose investments we also want to have in. Let's not forget, smallholder farmers often chuck in a lot of funding and a lot of non-financial means, and we are sinking their investment as well as ours if we don't do the front end well. Um, but maybe Acumen wants to say a few words about how they do this. There is a lot of work to be done around building the political will to actually look at the facts around climate risk. Um, otherwise, we would have long done it because the algorithms and the tools do exist. Back over to you, Ashani. Thank you, Iris. Chris, we have exactly 20 seconds. A uh, word of I advice? Think... Really appreciate, uh, Iris, your comments. I think we don't give smallholders enough credit, honestly. I think they do know they're, they're the impacts that are happening to them, and we should leverage that. And then we, we, we in essence, are exactly as Iris proposed, measuring um, climate resilience before our investment, and then ensuring that the patients of our capital and the companies that support them allow for long, slow transitions to these practices. Because the expectation that one or two farming seasons, and they're going to be regenerative or agroecological is absurd. And we have to lengthen that and we need the capital to do it. Fabulous, thank you, Chris. Uh, we encourage our audience to write to us with further questions, comments and reflections. The discussion has just begun on blended finance and catalytic donor fund funding. So please contact us and write to us. And now I will hand over to Maurizio Navarra Senior Partnerships Officer and Coordinator of the Global Donor Platform for a call to action and to close this event. Maurizio, over to you. Thanks a lot, Oshani, uh, for your excellent facilitation. And thank you to each of our speakers for your fantastic contributions today. And let me also thank all participants on behalf of the Donor Platform and the Shamba Center for joining us especially in this new format for side events, which is so short. So we had really to try to make the best out of it, out of the little time we had. So we have heard many concrete points on the need for the global community to strengthen our collective efforts and collaboration with the private sector to make donor funding more catalytic, to achieve progress towards ending hunger. Now, our speakers have emphasized the need for better linkages and increased synergies with other sources of development finance, such as climate finance, and we have also heard about the critical need to de-risk investments, how the work of the donor community can be vital in revitalizing small businesses and SMEs in the food system space. So these are just a few points our speakers touched upon today. Now the platform and the Shamba Center will continue to promote dialogues on innovative approaches to financing food system transformation. And as our co-chair Tristan Armstrong mentioned at the beginning of this session, we strongly encourage you to participate in our ongoing research on making public funding streams more catalytic through innovative financing approaches. So please get in touch with us if you would like to contribute to this ongoing work stream. Our email is posted in the chat, I believe, 
And you can visit our website, donorplatform.org, to contact us. We also encourage you to participate in our annual General Assembly on the 26th and 27th of October 2023, which will be held in hybrid format in Rome at IFAD headquarters. Now, this year's assembly coincided with the donor platform's 20th anniversary, a milestone reflected in the theme, 20 years of rural development and ineffectiveness. Where are we now and where are we going again? Clearly, we're going to host a conversation on innovative blend and finance is going to be one of the core sessions of our assembly uh, in October. So let me close this event by warmly thanking our distinguished speakers and participants, Oshani for your moderation and our colleagues at the Shamba Center for Food and Climate for leading this important work stream. Thank you for being with us, ladies and gentlemen, and see you next time.